I'm Saron Rosset from Tel Aviv University. Uh, thank you all for sticking with the program, and thanks to the organizers uh, for even showing up at some point. Uh, so as, as I know, uh, many of you are very closely following the program and reading all the papers that are posted uh, in anticipation of the talk. So you might be expecting a talk on quality preserving databases. That's actually my talk, my research talk next week. And as it turns out, the Hoover application is the right only application. So once the wrong title was on it, uh, that was uh, uh, the final uh, thing that's going to stay there. But my tutorial is actually going to be about uh, uh, statistical modeling of mutational processes. Uh, and basically, when we think about uh, uh, mutational processes, then obviously we all know that the genomes evolve in different ways, and, and one of the main ones is, the, is through mutations. And uh, mutations can include all the, uh, all the things we know about, uh, uh, SNPs, uh, repeat counts, insertions, deletions, and short tandem repeats, among many other things. Uh, and uh, the question that we are going to be uh, sort of asking ourselves uh, or, or that we're going to be starting from is what things affect the mutation rate uh, in the genome in general and in a specific point in the genome in particular. So obviously we have in mind things like the chemistry that's going on there, for example, the, uh, the difference between transitions and transversions uh, when we think about mutation rates. Obviously biology comes into play, for example, selection, synonymous versus non-synonymous. We have various issues dealing with selection, which is like what time scale we measure uh, mutation rates on may uh, look different due to selection. Uh, and then we may have the effects of sequence, location, time, and many other things that may or may not affect the probability uh, of mutation at a specific point. Uh, selection is the most difficult to deal with. And Basically, uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to allow for selection, but implicitly we're going to think of selection as something that means that mutations are either lethal or neutral. And so selection is going to come in through the mutation rate, okay? And more complex modes of selection we'll have to, uh, uh, we can discuss uh, offline. But our goal is to try to understand from data what are the variables affecting the mutation rate, and try to build models that uh, describe this dependence between uh, uh, observable variables and unobservable variables and mutation rate. Understand the statistical nature of the processes governing mutations. And uh, OK, so I should say, this talk is going to sort of, being a tutorial, I'm going to uh, try to focus on describing methodology and methodological ideas. But I'm going to be demonstrating that through our sort of recent research thread on uh, work on mitochondrial DNA. And, and I want to say that our research is rather preliminary. So uh, uh, the results I'm going to show you are going to be mostly for sort of demonstrating the use of the methodological ideas. That there's a ways to go with the maturity uh, uh, of our and completeness of the results. I'm happy to discuss that offline with people who are interested. Uh, more, more in the results and the kind of uh, biological implications. OK, so the data I'm going to focus on for a large part of my talk is this uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, uh, phylogenetic tree. And the thing that, uh, uh, that's very interesting about mitochondrial DNA, one for one, is that we have a very large number of complete mitochondrial genomes uh, uh, that are actually publicly available. But the other thing that's very important about uh, uh, mitochondria is due to the uniparental inheritance, obviously, this is actually a real phylogenetic tree, right? All mitochondrial genomes are a phylogenetic tree. And at the root of this phylogenetic tree, as we all know, sits uh, one lady. And she explains to him why she can't date him, because they have this uh, uh, common ancestor at the root of the tree. So they are related, and they can't date. <laughs> so. Uh, but, uh, but because it's a phylogenetic tree and because of properties of the mitochondrial DNA, in particular the high, relatively high mutation rate of the mitochondrial DNA compared to other parts of the genome, it turns out that we can actually infer this tree. Not only do we know that there exists a tree, we can, we can infer this phylogenetic tree of these 20,000 humans with very high accuracy, with very high confidence. Okay, uh, 
And the other thing we can then try to infer, and uh, I'm not going to discuss this, but, uh, but I believe it's true, and, and I can explain why uh, offline. We can actually infer not only the phylogeny, but also with re pretty high confidence the actual reconstructed ancestral sequences on this tree, meaning we can infer the mutations that have happened along this tree. Okay. Uh, and another thing that we may want to infer and is more difficult, but we can try to assume that we can do it reasonably well, is also infer the branch lengths. And if we can infer the ancestral uh, uh, states and the branch lengths, we have a very good view of the stochastic process that has generated this tree. Yeah. Well. I, I know because uh, under any reasonable model, uh, for example, if I take parsimony, then if I try to say to change anything in the tree that's not at the bottom, I'm going to incur a huge cost in terms of parsimony. Okay, and I can do an, an uh, equivalent likelihood calculation that says this is the by far the most likely tree. When we move to the reconstructed uh, uh, ancestral sequences, then we can make arguments like that about ancient sequences. It gets more difficult as you get closer to the bottom of the tree. But uh, what we are actually going to do is we are going to condition on the correctness of the tree and the correctness of, correctness of the ancestral sequences. And some of our analysis is also going to rely on, in, on knowing the branch lengths. Uh, and again, for me, uh, uh, I think for this talk, it's going, mostly going to be demonstration of methodology, so we can argue about validity of these uh, assumptions uh, uh, at another point. OK, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you the actual data, which I think is a very interesting data and very, uh, uh, very easily uh, uh, attained. And I, I think that it's quite underutilized by this community. So what we have here is actually a website that gives direct access to all these sequences. And we can, we can download the sequences, but we actually don't need the sequences because they are fully described by just a description of the tree that generated them. Right? We know the sequence at the root. This is uh, the most recent common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve. Uh, and this is like we describe the tree as this sort of deepest part of the tree, and then off it are hanging subtrees that at the leaves of these subtrees are, are present day sequences, right? So if you look at this uh, sort of deep structure, then uh, for anyone who knows this tree, all these L haplogroups, which are the deepest splits in the tree, all of them are present in Africa only. The out of Africa is this M and N branches are the out of Africa branches. Uh, Europeans are mostly on the N side. East Asians are mostly on the M, but uh, there's some East Asian haplogroups on the N side of the tree. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of history that's uh, uh, in here in the tree. Uh, and we can, for example, uh, go into one of the subtrees. This is now uh, lying sideways. So it, it gives us, again, for the ancient uh, part of the tree. And then this is going to be U and the sub haplogroups of U. Uh, and I uh, went into you. So if we go right, we're going to get to the leaves. The reason I went into you is that we're actually going to find me uh, in you very soon. Uh, and I actually sit in K, which I think is a sub haplogroup of U8. Yeah, U8, this is 7, 8, 9. OK. It's not the most uh, compelling. Uh, uh, once we get to K, oh, here, here we are. So uh, you're going to find me on this branch, K1A1B1A. Uh, and these are uh, probably Ashkenazi Jews, probably other Ashkenazi Jews. These are the sequences that actually sit on this branch. So this is a very uh, uh, unique Ashkenazi Jewish uh, branch. And uh, if you care about these things, you see, for example, that haplogroup K sits under U8, uh, under U8B, actually. So you may ask yourself what kind of uh, nomenclature was invented in such a way that K is actually a subgroup of U8B. And uh, if you think about it a little bit, you can easily guess what's the reason for that. 
basically this is uh, evidence of the historical uh, uh, interest of the scientific community in different areas of the tree, right? So haplogroup K, which happened to contain many Ashkenazi Jews, was defined well before haplogroup U, which is actually a super tree of uh, haplogroup K. Okay, but, uh, and as you see, there's a reconstruction here of the, uh, uh, of the mutations that happened on each of a uh, branch of the tree. Notice that some of them are in blue and some are in black. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so basically this is saying, if you want, that uh, if we look at my branch, we have these three mutations that separate my branch from other sub, uh, sorry, this is not my branch, but whatever. It, it, these three mutations separate this branch from other branches at, this bo at the bottom of this tree. Uh, leading to present-day uh, humans. Okay, let's remind ourselves for a moment uh, of the structure of the mitochondrial DNA. This is the mitochondrial DNA molecule. It's a circular piece of DNA. Uh, I guess many of you know that around here, around the origin of replication is what's called the control region, and the control region is special because its mutation rate is actually much, fast, much faster than the coding region. So the mutations in blue on the tree we saw before are control region mutations. And the coding region is also unique in the, in the fact that it contains actually densely packed genes with very little non-coding uh, DNA between them. Uh, and this ND6 is special in, in the sense that it's sitting on the opposite strand to all the other genes, and that's going to come up uh, later as well. Okay, so uh, let's uh, look at some, oops, let's look at some statistics. So now we have, we, we have phylo tree. We choose to believe the, uh, the, reconstru the ancestral reconstruction that phylo tree gives us. So we can now take the list of mutations that are inferred by this uh, phylogenetic reconstruction, and we can look at, for example, uh, at the mutations per site. How many mutations have occurred in each site uh, within this tree of 20-something thousand uh, human sequences? And as you see, this is from position about 550 to about 16,000. So I've excluded the control region here, because the control region, some loss in the control region would have much higher number of mutations. And that also makes our ancestral reconstruction of the control region sequences uh, uh, much less uh, uh, reliable. Okay? So we're going to concentrate on the coding region. When we look at the coding region, we also see that some sites have mutated. This is outside the control region. This is site 709, which has mutated over 150 times according to our sequence reconstruction. And there's a bunch of others that have mutated, uh, uh, that have over 50 mutations. There's also a large number of sites that have mutated zero times in our uh, reconstruction. And here we see some statistics. So the total number of inferred mutations is about 22,000 over this 15,000 uh, uh, 15, and a half sites in the coding region, so about one and a half mutation per site. But we see 12,000 sites with zero mutations, so about over 70% of the sites have zero mutations, and some sites have as many as 100 or even more. Okay? So this is a very interesting uh, statistics we get on the mutation counts on the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so uh, let's step back and, and start thinking about sort of uh, uh, probabilistic models, stochastic process models that could help us uh, deal with this data. So first of all, remind ourselves of the concept of a memory, memoryless process. So a memoryless process is a process where the time to the next event is independent of the time since the previous event. So if I want to know the probability that my waiting time until the event is bigger than some t plus delta t, where I know I've already waited t time. So I've waited an, an hour and nothing happened. How long is my wait until I see something happening? So a memoryless process means I don't care how much time has passed. My, uh, my time to, uh, uh, to wait depends only on looking forward how much time I want to consider, okay? So this is a very important property, this memoryless property. And if that property holds, it means automatically that t has an exponential distribution. Uh, uh, with parameter theta, which is the mean, and I'm going to denote lambda by one over theta, and that's going to be useful in a second. And if we think of the arrival of people in a bank line, we may think that that's probably a very good uh, 
example of a memoryless process because people are making their decisions independently. There's some rate at which people are arriving at the bank in a specific hour, uh, but each one of them is pulling into the parking lot completely independently of what other people are doing. So the information that no one has come in for the last minute doesn't really tell me anything about how long until the next person is going to come in. Uh, as long as their rate of arrival is fixed, right? So uh, I do care whether I'm now in the morning or in the afternoon, in a weekend or in a weekday, but I don't care how much time has passed since the last person came in. So that's a memoryless process. And I think it's easy to convince ourselves that neutral mutations happening in the genome is pretty well approximated by a memoryless process because uh, whether or not a mutation happened uh, uh, in my genome, uh, uh, when my genome was created, is pretty much independent of the question of whether a mutation will happen, a neutral mutation will happen when I pass my genome on to my uh, kids. So at least to first order, it's probably a good idea to think about mutations as a memoryless process. Therefore, there's some exponential uh, uh, waiting time going on. Now, if we have a memoryless process with a fixed rate, then it easily implies, as I'm sure many of us have learned, that the time that if I take some fixed time t, then the number of events that are going to happen in this time has a Poisson distribution with a parameter that's proportional to the time that has passed. This is this one over theta times the time that I've been waiting, okay? This is the formula that we don't care about of Poisson. But now, instead of how much longer until someone arrives in the bank, this is the number of people arriving to a bank line in a 10 minute period or an hour period or whatever I choose. Okay, so uh, we have Poisson. Yesterday, uh, Lior talked about uh, uh, this move from Poisson to negative binomial, so we're going to recap that. Uh, so the question we're going to ask ourselves is, is do mutation counts in the genome follow a Poisson process? What do we need to assume for that? So one thing we need to assume that it's memoryless, and I, I said and I believe that that's actually a very mild assumption. The other thing we need to assume is that the mutation rate is fixed, and that's independent of the possible affecting factors that we've mentioned before. Okay, and if it's true, then uh, uh, we would have a Poisson process. But what happens if the rate is not fixed? So we can think of different rate per site or per time or per anything else, and that would mean that we have a process that's memoryless, but the rate is changing, okay? For example, as we move from one side to another, or as we move from one point in history to another, the rate may be changing. So this is clearly an over-dispersed Poisson. The number of events in a Poisson process with changing rate would be one way to think about an over-dispersed Poisson. And one way to model this idea of over-dispersion is through this negative binomial distribution. And what one way to think of this is we have some random variable lambda that has a gamma distribution. Given lambda, we have a Poisson distribution. So if I assume, uh, uh, if I'm given lambda, then I have a Poisson distribution with rate lambda. But if I'm not given lambda, so I'm integrating over the distribution of this unknown rate lambda, what I get is a negative binomial distribution. And we have this alpha parameter that it inherits from the gamma distribution. Okay, and alpha is a very, the important parameter for our purpose. It's the shape parameter, and as alpha goes to infinity, we get closer to a Poisson. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, one way to describe this. If we look at the expectation of y, it's obviously the same as the expectation of gamma because of lambda because of the Poisson, and uh, I'm sure Israelis know why I call this gamma all the time. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so the expectations are the same. Uh, but what about the variance? So if I was a Poisson, then the variance is equal to the expectation, right? Uh, but uh, for negative binomial, the variance is bigger than the expectation and possibly much bigger. And basically, it's much bigger if alpha is small because the mean is alpha over beta. Beta gets scaled together with alpha, but it's really alpha that determines uh, the variance. And now, uh, as sort of a person from statistics, uh, I wanted, uh, and following in, uh, in Leo Pachter's steps, I wanted to, uh, to have a class exercise. What simple probability argument is going to give us that this variance is bigger than that, not worrying about any formula or anything else? What simple probability argument gives us that 
the variance of y is basically uh, bigger than the expected value of variance of y given lambda, which is the expectation of y because it's Poisson. So we have a very important, very fundamental probability rule that tells us that this is bigger, that the variance of y is, is basically bigger than the uh, uh, var variance of the expectation of y given lambda. OK. Anybody? Yeah, law of total variance. So we were talking yesterday about how, how fundamental. So this is an aside, something that I think is a very important uh, point to point out. Remind everyone of the law of total variance. So if I have any two random variables, the variance of u is the, expected, is the expectation of the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional expectation. Right? So let's apply it to our case. So the variance of y is the expected value of the variance of y given, given lambda. What's the variance of y given lambda? Give, y given lambda has a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda, right? So what's what, the mean of that is lambda, the variance of that? Lambda as well. So here we have the, uh, uh, basically the expectation of lambda plus the variance of the expectation of y given lambda. What's the expectation of y given lambda? That's lambda again, right? So this is the variance of y is the expectation of lambda plus the variance of lambda, which assuming lambda doesn't have a, a trivial distribution is bigger than the expectation of lambda, which is the expectation of y. Uh, and I, I made this aside because Maybe it's an overstatement, but I still think it's, a, it's a, a valid point that the law of total variance and the law of iterated expectations, which is simpler and I won't mention it here, basically would solve 50% of our applied probability problems if, if uh, uh, properly applied. So I think that conditioning is very fundamental to, to probabilistic thinking, and, these two, uh, and this rule uh, really uh, crops up in many, in many places when we want to think probabilistically. OK, so, but our point was about this distribution of mutation counts. So uh, I think by looking at it, we all, we all see immediately that this is not what a Poisson distribution looks like. But let's, for the fun of it, just fit a Poisson uh, uh, to this observed uh, mutation counts. OK, so here's the best Poisson fit in terms of sort of a maximum likelihood fit of Poisson to this data. And clearly, uh, it looks nothing like our observed mutation counts. Uh, in particular, a Poisson with the same mean, which is the maximum likelihood fit, would have more ones than zeros. In our data, we have many more zeros than ones in uh, the mutation counts. So obviously, uh, uh, the next thing we want to do is fit a negative binomial to this data. Uh, and this is the best negative binomial fits. And it also doesn't fit very well because of this very uh, extreme tail that we've, the, the behavior of the tail is actually not consistent with uh, any uh, negative binomial distribution. But it still looks much better. I mean, qualitatively, this has the same, the, the right flavor to it, even if it doesn't fit very well to this uh, data. OK, but this is really not our goal. Our goal is to understand the variables that are affected. So, so what's clear from here is that there's no, there's no uh, Poisson process with fixed rate that's governing the mutations throughout the mitochondrial uh, uh, genome. And that's probably not surprising. Uh, our goal, our real goal is to understand what kind of mutation, what kind of variables affect the mutation rate, what kind of things we can measure affect the mutation rate. So, uh, OK, this we said already. Uh, we assume a memoryless process. Waiting times are definitely exponential. But the rate depends on variables which may be observable or unobservable. right? So if it depends on unobservable variables, we're basically left with this uh, over-dispersed Poisson negative binomial view that uh, we know it's not Poisson. If we want to have a good statistical model, we have to account for the over-dispersion. What happens if, depend, if, it, uh, uh, if the rates, the change in rates, are actually explainable by observable variables, like the sequence, like whether we're counting transitions of transversions, like synonymous, non-synonymous mutations, and so on, like which region in, of the mitochondrial genome we're in, uh, uh, and so on. So in that case, we, have, we, have a, a, we are saying, let's condition on these variables. And if we properly condition on these variables, we may actually be back to having Poisson processes, 
conditional on the variables that explain why Poisson rates differ, okay? So, uh, so our point of view is we now have a vector of these explanatory variables, and we're going to assume or, or try to assume that conditional on the variables we have a Poisson distribution. So uh, what we typically assume, uh, the form of dependence we typically assume is that the log of the rate is a linear or some other simple function of the variables we observe. So if we do this, then basically we're doing a Poisson regression, right? Basically f fitting, <coughs> fitting these parameters better, estimating these parameters better is a Poisson regression, which is a generalized linear model like the example uh, we're most familiar with would be logistic regression. And that puts us uh, very well in the middle of sort of mainstream statistical inference. And what does that mean? It means that it's easy to estimate with maximum likelihood. It's actually a convex maximum likelihood problem. But beyond that, it gives us inference like significance uh, estimates on the variables. And more importantly, it gives us model selection, right? So we can say, let's try two different sets of variables and see with whether one fits actually better than the other for our problem. Uh, one, thing we may, one thing we may and we should worry about, okay, it may be that these variables affect our rate, but they may, be, they may not be all the variables affecting our rate. There may be some unobservable variables affecting our rate, right? In that case, we can't assume a Poisson. What would we like to assume? So maybe we can assume a negative binomial even given the observed variables, right? So this is something I'm not going to uh, expand on, but we can now say, let's assume that we observe some variable affecting the rates and some are unobserved. So now we would have a negative binomial with the uh, uh, parameters that depend on the variables we observe, but still some over dispersion left, some alpha bigger than, uh, uh, smaller than infinity remaining. Okay, and this is a bit, this is falling outside mainstream GLM. Basically, if we assume alpha is known, then we are still in GLM. But really, we care about this J parameter alpha. And in this, in this case, we have to, to solve some problems that are not actually uh, GLMs. And that also hurts our ability to do all this inference that we really care about. OK, so uh, one thing we can now say is let's revisit what we studied in introduction to statistical genetics and see whether it fits into this model. So the thing that, we fo that, that these courses are often focused on are these substitution models that, dis that describe how mutations happened in the genome. For example, Jux Cantor just saying that everything has a fixed rate. So under Jux Cantor, we have a Poisson process. If we do something like assume the Felsenstein, whatever, five, six, I forget how many parameters model, then we're assuming that the rate depends on the starting nucleotide and a different rate for transitions and transversions. This can be easily framed in our Poisson regression framework, right? The explanatory variables are uh, uh, the, uh, the nucleotides. And we have basically a, a separate Poisson regression for transitions and transversions. Uh, and then one very interesting thing that's, that's done in uh, uh, maybe in the last 15 years is adding this gamma, which is basically saying there's a random distribution of rates that encapsulates dependence on unobserved variables. So this is like a negative binomial version of this model. OK? OK, so just the point is that these things actually fit pretty well into our, our uh, framework of uh, thinking on, uh, about Poisson and negative binomial regression. Okay, so uh, now let's look at some, uh, let's try to apply these models to the mitochondrial data for a little while. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to do is I want to show you some analysis that, that my student who's working on this, this uh, Karen Levenstein uh, did, uh, and that's going to sort of guide us into what might be interesting to test. So this very nice exercise she did here is she went back to the uh, sort of the vision of the mitochondria into genes, into functional regions, and asked, do the mutation processes differ between the different functional uh, regions or between the genes in the uh, mitochondrial DNA? And the way she did it is she defined these five statistical tests that she applied to comparing pairs of genes. OK, to comparing all pairs of genes. And basically, we have here A and E, for some reason they are separated, are tests on the marginal distribution of the bases or the codons in the uh, genes. And B, C, and D are basically tests comparing uh, mutation rates. 
whether those more mutations in, in uh, one gene compared to the other. So we have three uh, tests. The details are not critical. Three tests of rate, basically, rate distribution versus overall rate, and two tests of, uh, of uh, the sequence composition, sequence and, and codon composition. Uh, and now we can do all uh, genes in the, in the coding region, compare all pairs of genes. Uh, and basically, we have this cluster of the six ND genes and the three CO genes, which actually, uh, okay, what we have here, sorry, what we have here is, uh, this is actually arbitrary, but we chose uh, all tests that were significant, so all pairs that were significantly different at level 0.05. This basically lists all tests that were rejected at level 0.05 for every pair of genes. Okay, so we see that within this uh, class of the ND genes and the CO genes, we have almost no rejections. We have the AE rejections between ND6 and the others. So someone uh, who remembers biology or what we showed in the middle can tell me why this is. What's special about ND6? That it's in the, on the opposite strand, right? So actually once you flip it to the right strand, this disappears. Okay, the, the, the nucleotide composition, this is actually for the complementary uh, nucleotide. So there is some nucleotide bias, but it's actually common to all these genes. It's the same bias, and once you flip this gene, you get that it's actually common to all of them. None of the uh, mutation rate uh, or mutation distribution tests rejected anywhere in this uh, area. Uh, and you see that they uh, rejected a lot between these uh, three genes and these eight genes. So we have basically three classes of, uh, of genes in the, according to this sort of clustering, this uh, uh, rough clustering idea, we have this cluster of genes, this cluster of genes, which are the two ATP genes, and this guy, which is different uh, from the others. Okay, so, uh, so if we believe that, here's a nice question to test with our statistical framework. Should we be, when now when we're building a Poisson regression or a negative binomial regression model for the mutation rate in the uh, mitochondrial DNA coding region, should we be lumping these into one, basically one category, and just assuming that uh, they all behave similarly, or should we still be uh, using the separate genes as separate explanatory variables in our model? Okay, so let's, let's do a formal test to examine that, and. Uh, we have basically four options here. Whether we use a rate per gene or we combine genes according to our clustering, and whether we use Poisson regression or negative binomial regression. And all our models include the variables that are clearly important by analysis, which are, for example, the, the sequence neighbors, the current codon, the codon position, which basically says how many synonymous versus non-synonymous mutations we have. Uh, only in position three we have uh, synonymous mutations. And we're going to use formal statistical inference to choose between these four models, whether we use a rate for gene or a, a combine according to the clustering, and whether we do Poisson or negative binomial regression. Uh, and we get very clear results on one question and, and not so uh, clear results on the other question. The first question is whether Poisson regression is appropriate or negative binomial regression is appropriate, which is like asking, have we included everything that affects the rate in our model, or have we eliminate, have we uh, excluded some important variables to explain the rates? Uh, and uh, we can do generalized likelihood ratio tests, or we could just use AIC. So here I use AIC, and we see that the AIC is much, very significantly smaller. So uh, a difference of two or three is a sort of a, a really small difference. Here we have a difference of 13,000 in the AIC, which is basically the log likelihood. Uh, and so we see that the negative binomial regression is much more appropriate. Between the, all, the model that includes variables for all genes versus clustering, then we see the difference in 10 degrees of freedom because the ones with all genes has 10 more variables in it than the ones with uh, clusters. Uh, but we see that the AIC is, is smaller. I mean, so there's a significant difference here in favor of the model that still allows different rate per gene. Okay, so one, one lesson to learn from this is that this is a very strong effect. This is not such a strong effect. But because we have so much data, so many mutations, 
it is still more statistically beneficial to allow a parameter per gene than uh, uh, to cluster them according to their uh, uh, to the clustering that we suggested. Uh, another nice thing we can do, uh, I'll, I'll try to go over this briefly, uh, is uh, ask ourselves about the effect of codon position on rate is obviously very major, right? Because the third codon is much more uh, amenable to mutations than the first and second codon in coding regions. So what we've used, what we've done about, above is use the codon position as an explanatory variable. What does it mean to use it as an explanatory variable? It means that we assume an additive effect of the codon on the mutation rate, but this is on the log scale where we're doing our regression. So basically, we're assuming a multiplicative effect of the codon position. So being in third position makes you 50 times more likely to have a mutation than being in the second position and so on. Okay, but all other variables, their effects remain the same whether you're in the second or the third position. So uh, let's make a competition here. The other alternative is to say, let's separate the model into a model per codon. So instead of having one model with an, a multiplicative effect of codon, let's have a model that allows all variables to have different uh, uh, roles in different codon positions. And then we can test between these models, again, using AIC or generalized likelihood ratio test. And we can also look at these alpha values, which are very important. Remember, this is the shape parameter for negative binomial, because we really want to see these alpha values growing, increasing, because that means we are putting more variables that explain things into our model and are getting closer to a Poisson distribution, right? So. Uh, so this is just, so uh, we saw the, uh, the result of the model with the multiplicative effect. That's the result we chose in the previous analysis. So this is AIC of this and alpha of that. Now we examine a model with a different model per codon. Uh, and so that gives us about uh, 250 variable, 250 degrees of freedom where we had 85 before, but the AIC is much improved. Okay, and when we look at the alpha values, we see very small alpha values for the first and second position, much bigger alpha value compared to, FS to point, 0 0.3 uh, for the third codon position. So our model has uh, uh, improved significantly in the third codon position, and really the third codon position is the important one because that's where the vast majority of the mutations happen. Uh, these two are because we have some very extreme sites in the first two positions that we can't explain what's going on there, and that keeps the shape parameter very small. Overall, we've concluded that we're much better splitting a model per position rather than just having an effect, a multiplicative effect of the position. So to conclude this analysis, the idea is to use these regressions to identify important variables. When we do this in mitochondrial DNA, all variables we've been able to think about so far are significant, but some are only marginally important, like splitting between, splitting the clustering into the regions is, has very small effect, significant but small. Other things have a very, very significant and very strong effects. Uh, and the shape parameters we're getting for the negative binomials are small, meaning we are still very far from the Poisson process that we aspire to, the conditional Poisson process we aspire to. So we're miss missing lots of things that either we haven't thought of or are un unobservable, uh, but we, we've, we're making progress in things like the third codon position model. And this is, where, this is the road we're trying to go down to try to uh, uh, find what's affecting the mutation uh, rates, at least in the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, in, in the few minutes that I have left, like five minutes? Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to go quickly through a different, uh, uh, a completely different uh, uh, case study. Uh, this of mutation rates in, in short tandem repeat, so uh, as Melissa mentioned yesterday, we have these uh, uh, short tandem repeats like ACAC, ACAC, and we have here an addition of the fifth. This has very high mutation rate relative to uh, SNPs, also in the uh, in the autosomal uh, uh, regions. Uh, and we and this is also very interesting because we now don't have just uh, this this four state uh, uh, random process, but we actually have a random walk. Right? We can think of this. And these mutations as a random walk on the integers uh, on the length of the uh, short tandem repeat. Uh, 
So uh, we can take a conditional Poisson view as well here. Uh, and we can try to ask ourselves what uh, uh, the rates depend on, like the, obviously the current repeat number, whether it's a lengthening or a shortening mutation, whether it's going up or down the, uh, the sequence, what the motif is, AC in the example we saw, neighboring sequence, and so on. And, but we also may want to think about what kind of things are reasonable because we may want to have a stationary distribution. What does it mean to have a stationary distribution? It means if we let this process run forever, we, it makes no sense maybe that it escapes to infinity or goes negative. That, that, that these are things that, uh, that should not happen for a realistic mutation model, right? So for example, we cannot, it's not, Probably we don't want to have a model where lengthening always has higher probability than shortening because then by definition there's no stationary distribution and we, as evolution runs to infinity, the, the, uh, the lengths are going to explode. Uh, we can think that maybe there are other mutations breaking the sequence that could work with this, but if we want a stationary distribution, we can't allow this. Uh, and we can still use Poisson regression uh, uh, in this view. Uh, here's a, here's a, a paper from actually pretty old, but they did very nice work. So they took uh, 120,000 uh, transmissions of parent offspring uh, triplets. So they had 230 triplets, but about 400 STRs, autosomal STRs for uh, each one. And they found 53 uh, uh, what they call mutations, which are just Mendelian mismatches between the child and the two parents. Right? Now, obviously, there's probably more mutations which do not create uh, mismatches, right? Because the mutation might make the uh, STR value of the child look like the STR value of the other parent or the other chromosome of the same parent and, and so on. Uh, so uh, that may, th this, this uh, biparental inheritance makes it much more complicated to analyze this data. You cannot just do a Poisson regression. But they did a good job of doing maximum likelihood models basically uh, to understand the mutational process uh, uh, of this. Uh, so uh, here's just a view of the naive mutation. So these are uh, Mendelian mismatches that they found. Uh, the interesting thing we see is that minus one and plus one are the most common, but minus two and plus two are not that rare. So it seems the jumps of two are not, uh, 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 are not rare. Uh, this is the length at which this is very typical. We see that the bigger the count, the more frequent, the bigger the count of the uh, uh, repeat in the STRs, the more frequent uh, mutations. Uh, and this is the interesting thing. This is actually the model they fitted to the data. This is showing the mutation rate for uh, uh, lengthening and shortening as a function of the parental microsatellite length. Uh, and we see the behavior we expected to see. Right? First of all, we see this increase with length of the mutation rate, and, but we see that uh, length is shorter than 20, lengthening is more likely than shortening, and that length is over 20, uh, we get the opposite effect. And this is just the result of the model they fit to the data. Right? And here's a view of the model. So basically, this is the model they chose. It has five parameters, which is uh, like uh, uh, an overall rate, uh, for increasing and decreasing, and the change of rate is, uh, these alphas are basically the slopes of the two uh, curves we showed before, the alpha D and alpha up, uh, and this probability of jumping by more than one. So uh, basically they, they, uh, they got a nice fit uh, to this data. Uh, so uh, they got a model that has a stationary distribution and has this behavior uh, we expected, and that allows jumps of more than one repeat. OK, so uh, to summarize, uh, the, the idea of an exponential waiting time or a Poisson process, I think, is, is very general and very appropriate, but the rate may change. So if we look at the process with changing rate, it doesn't look like a Poisson process, but it's actually a, a variable rate Poisson process. Uh, and it de may depend on, on, uh, on many things. The things we observe, we can put into a Poisson regression framework and model the dependence on them. The things we don't observe, we have to account for with uh, over dispersion. 
so negative binomial regression is kind of the general solution uh, to this uh, whole thing. Uh, and for mitochondrial DNA is a special place where we think uh, uh, we can make a lot of progress and, and we've made uh, a little bit of that uh, uh, in building these models. Okay, thanks. <laughs>